So, Chris, what do you do? Uh, four things. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a mastering engineer, which means basically spend all day and most nights in the studio. That's why I've got a healthy studio <laughs> tan. Um, secondly, I'm a producer. Thirdly, I'm a DJ. And fourthly, I edit a magazine, which I'll pass around. You guys can have a look. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, cool. Pass. I just want to grab these and have a look. Um, basically, been working in the industry for about 13 years. Okay, 13, yeah? yeah. Not 30. No, yeah. no, not that old. Mm. Um, and started out just uh, in live sound, working on rigging and stuff, funnily enough, uh, with a lot of bands that were coming out here, Crowded House and Depeche Mode and OMD mm. and... All the bands so working. you'll do the front of house mixing? Helping with the rigging and stuff. Oh, okay. We are yeah, learning, yeah. basically. Okay. But then, uh, after working... Uh, 50 did, you have the, did you have the obligatory black t-shirt and black trousers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. after working 56 mm. hours non-stop on the beach one day, I decided live sound wasn't for me anymore. Sure. Um, then got into studio, started editing. Uh, luckily, missed most of the tape editing stage, mm. thank God. Um, any of you ever edited on tape? <laughs> it's a complete a joke. <laughs> you don't ever want to do it, trust me. You've got to make working copies of what you've done, then you start editing. If you make a mistake, you've got to go to the next copy, cut from there. It's quite a mission. And then afterwards, like, run the whole lot down onto another tape. Uh, adds a lot of noise as well. Sure. Some of it good noise, mm -hmm. <laughs> not all of it. Um, yeah, so what kind of... Um, when you first started, what kind of systems were you using? Um, when I first started editing, it was a small little Mac with uh, the very first sound tools, which was the baby brother of Pro Tools, okay. like before Pro Tools came out. Um, it was just a basic 16-bit uh, two-channel editing program um, mm. uh, with not much else on it besides like some rudimentary EQs and uh, a couple of crappy compressors sure, and stuff sure. like that. Um, so a lot of our processing was done in analog domain as well, okay. um, which still is the best way to do it, EQ-wise. Do you think so? Yeah, absolutely. Still, we can, still we can, the best. We can yeah. maybe touch on that a bit later. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Mm. Just EQ-wise. I mean, uh, in terms of all the other processing, it's better, much better digitally, mm. but uh, EQ is still definitely better okay. than analog. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, I brought a few examples of... Uh, Tracks that are unmastered and tracks that are mastered, well, the same tracks mastered, give you a bit of an idea of what the difference is. And then after the session, we'll do a, a practical um, where I actually take the track that you guys have done and master it uh, to give you a better idea of exactly what goes on. I've got a finalizer here, which um, kind of, uh, yeah, is a unit that's designed for mastering. It's uh, got a whole mastering chain inside. I'll go through it with you and show you exactly what it's about. You can do everything that's on here on software, and most people do. But uh, I thought I'd bring it along just to show you guys, because it's an easy way to demo um, sort of what mastering is. How many of you guys have actually put records out before? Uh, so you kind of been through the process? Yeah. And any of you other guys been through the mastering process? Yeah, cool, OK. Um, basically, what it entails is um, two things. Firstly, EQ, balancing your track so that throughout the frequency spectrum, audible and inaudible, you get a, um, a balanced sound, basically. That's the first part of it. Um, it's all relative, so every time you change one thing, the whole mix changes. So it's like a continuous uh, refining until you get the right sound. Um, Second to that is the dynamics part of it. Uh, as you may know, if it's louder, it's better, as most people see it in the, in the world. Not always true, but usually if it sounds louder, it's better. Um, so the dynamics part of it, it perceived dynamics as well as um, actual dynamic range. Um, uh, we'll go through that with the finalizer. It's quite a nice way to demonstrate it and um, on these demos I've got here as well. Um, yeah, uh, basically what you've got to try and do as a mastering engineer is get it as hot as possible, get it as balanced as possible onto digital format or if you're doing records onto analog format um, without perceivably changing the mix. 
I mean, if you guys have gone and spent like three weeks mixing a track, I don't want to go and um, change your sound in the two or three hours that I master it. I've got to try and get it to where I want it without changing the sound at all. Perceivably, anyway. Trick your ears into believing that it still sounds exactly the same. That's basically the idea. Let me um, play you guys a few tracks and uh, give you some sort of references of where I'm coming from. And I'll play you um, an unmastered version first and then um, we'll go into the mastered version just to give you background. The bass is quite floppy in the bottom end and uh, there's a lot of frequencies in there that aren't really doing the mix much good. Um, give you the mastered version now and see what you think. The clarity becomes a lot better. Yeah, um, and it yeah, yeah, it becomes a lot louder basically. Yeah. Um, a lot tighter too. Can you guys feel it's a bit tighter? Yeah. Uh, I've got like a couple of other examples that I'll play just so you can get a few reference points. But um, uh, yeah, let me play some more. But what, I want to ask a question. So, the the the, the, the pre-mastered version was yeah. that the person who mixed that obviously thinks that's a mix, right? Yeah. yeah. So it, doesn't it create a kind of um, feeling of insecurity that you know you master it, you mix a track thinking that it's it's kind of to your best of your ability? No, because there's there's about three engineers in the whole world that don't get EQ'd when they go for mastering. So, I mean, <laughs> everyone gets EQ'd. The mastering engineer EQs everything, trust sure, me. Sure. Yeah. Um, what uh, Murray and David were touching on yesterday, if you guys were in the studio, about um, um, keeping the dynamics fairly open when you're mixing is quite true. The more dynamic the actual mix is, the more I can do with it once I'm mastering it. The harder, uh, the harder I can push it, and uh, if it's too compressed, it's harder for me to do my job. Um, so just remember that when you guys lay down a mix, lay it down compressed as you want it, lay it down dynamic, and um, even lay it down on different formats, DAT or um, CD as well, um, and go through whichever one sounds better to you and use that one. Cool, and play a few more. Basically what I want is I don't want the mix to change much. You can hear the mix is still fairly similar. I mean, there's a lot of things that have actually changed, but perceivably it's still fairly similar to what you heard before. The less you can hear the difference, the better for me, actually, as long as it's louder and it's kicking. <laughs> Any questions at this point? Yeah, so far. Yeah, yeah Dev? I don't want a microphone. Yeah. Oh, cheers. Um, Chris, is this mic on? Yeah. Uh, the for for both for both of those tracks, did yeah. you, was it a, a, a multi-band and EQ combination or one or yeah, two? Yeah, um, use basically. Well, I mean, I use a a mixture of a multi-band compressor, a multi-band limiter. Um, what, is it, what does that mean? Sorry. It means basically the way that it was done originally is, I don't know if any of you guys have worked with a channel splitter live, where you split the bass, mids, and and highs into separate uh, uh, signals so that you can feed different amps to play your sound through. Um, basically that's how it was done originally in mastering. They would split up the lows, mids and highs and then compress them separately because you, why, why could, is that, why you is could set that? different attacks on, mm -hmm. on the highs because they're a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, set a slower attack on the bottom end because it's a lot slower and it okay. works a lot slower. Um, basically creating a much tighter mix and right. a much louder mix as well. Okay. Um, also allows you to EQ all three of them separately as well. Mm -hmm. Now on the finalizer, it's got a, 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 the, the three band um, mm. uh, uh, compressors and limiters mm are already here, so I mean it splits it up for you automatically and then you can adjust them. I'll show you guys that when we do the practical a bit later. Would you say um, that um, mastering is music genre specific? For example, I mean I wouldn't, Absolutely. I wouldn't imagine that you would mm. master a rock record the same way you would no. you'd master a reggae record. No. Also, the audiences are looking for different things as mm. well. Like an R&B record, um, the guys are looking for a hell of a bass response. I mean, mm. You've got a much wider bass range that you use sure. in R&B than you would in, say, like house or, sure. or rock, especially rock. Rock is quite thin, actually, mm. when you master it. Um, 
Um, yeah, so it's definitely genre specific. And in terms of dance music, even there's like specific things. I mean, like uh, certain breakbeat styles uh, uh, would be like a lot more bass heavy than. For example, yeah. so drum and drum bass, bass, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, even the prodigy stuff is quite okay. like, you know, breakbeat stuff. Yeah. Um, whereas like some house producers will, will like try and pull back a bit on the, on the bottom end just to uh, get more punch, you mm -hmm. know. Um, yeah, so it is very genre specific, absolutely. Have you ever, um, what's been your worst mastering experience? <laughs> There's too many to mention. Uh, <laughs> in this country, we have 11 official languages, um, and a lot of the mastering that I've done in the past would get sent to me on an unmarked tape mm -hmm. with nothing, basically, and, and a track listing from the record company and having to put the two together try and work out which song is which through trying to pick up some of the lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if not working that out, going to find someone that actually speaks the language to come mm -hmm. and help me out. Um, also, just some of the, the actual mixes that I've got in the past have been like horrific. I mean, like 50 hertz hum coming through the whole mix. Zzz, <laughs> um, noise, like... <laughs> Yeah, like it's serious. That's, that's seri character, I think. Yeah, character. no, not that. I mean, <laughs> noise, like characteristic noise, Dr. Moogle mm. agree with us, characteristic electronic noise is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, it adds a flavor to the sound. Sure. But just general tape is not, <laughs> not cool at all. And, and like just bad wiring okay. um, um, contributes to that as well. Do you guys know the difference between a balanced signal and an unbalanced signal? Basically what it is, is uh, in your cabling, you have a shield which covers like the, the, the um, wire that the signal goes through, the hot signal. In a two-core cable, the shield is used for signal as well. So your negative or your ground runs down the shield. So any noise, any sort of lighting cables or electrical noise gets picked up into the cable and transferred into your sound. So basically it picks up noise from everywhere. Now what happens with a balanced cable is three core, um, it's got a shield and the other two cables as well. So basically the ground just takes away all the noise um, and protects your signal. So any time that you've got the opportunity to use a balanced um, signal, rather use the balanced than the unbalanced, it's much cleaner. Um, it's much hotter as well, it play, it can play much louder on a balanced signal. Um, yeah, just a bit of trivial information. Mm. No, it's good to know. Yeah. Um, do you have some more? Music. Yeah, yeah. I've got a couple more here that I can play. CDs. The difference between an, a branded one and an unbranded is this, is this process, essentially. Um, Mine to be. No, not no, 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 not necessarily. I mean, you get some unbranded ones that are pretty good as well. Mm. Um, uh, no, it's, it's got nothing to do with that. I mean, I use a specific branded CD because at the CD pressing plant where most of our stuff gets pressed, they've had less trouble with mm. this brand than any other brand. Sure. So I use that specific brand just because of that. But um, if I don't think it's, it's, it's going to make a difference uh, too much. W I mean, there are certain sort of Taiwanese and, and uh, mm -hmm. various other sort of uh, uh, cheap copies that are really bad and you shouldn't really use them for mastering. But, but it's got to such a stage now where most, most CDRs are usable. Mm -hmm. Um, but but w when the actual laser is writing, burning onto the CD, you're going to get errors getting yeah. transferred sure. somewhere along the line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, getting on a bit back onto you know personal productions and stuff. Um, I make music and I my phone's ringing, but I don't care. Yeah. Um, I make music at home and also you know I, I make demos at home and I also yeah. produce records and yeah. master at home yeah. uh, in the studio. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, what things should I think about when I'm actually producing records or mixing records? Basically, um, I, I got the best advice from an engineer um, called Jay. Uh, he uh, mixed Prince's Black album. He came out to do okay. Miriam McKeever's mm -hmm. album at our studio. I used to work in a very high-profile studio. We um, did uh, Lion King 2 soundtrack, the Lion King 3 soundtrack, other stuff for Disney. Um, 
Um, so mm -hmm. a very high profile studio in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. prob probably the highest profile studio What's in Johannesburg, um, CSR. And what kind of I desk think it's actually in this yeah. bag. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, it's, uh, they basically got uh, 144 input euphonics mixing console. Mm -hmm. um, they've got two other studios with high end digital mixing um, capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, all running, uh, they're running the Pro Tools high density 192 kilohertz okay. sampling. I'm going to get into that in a yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, yeah, they're running those systems throughout. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, uh, where was I going? I've lost my oh, point. Oh, he's, he's mixed a black oh, album. Uh, mix, yeah, yeah the, uh, the, 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 the advice that he gave, uh, and this is probably the best that I've heard, is put the mix down to a soft level where you can just sort of like hear. Um, like it's quite soft, but not too soft that you can't hear. And if if you can hear everything balanced, um, when you listen to it that way, and it, it, you can hear everything cleanly and and balanced, your mix is right, basically to send for mastering. Yeah, I mean, the more dynamic range you've got, the more the mastering engineer can do with it. Um, uh, I can do like a hell of a lot more work on something that's like fairly open and got like. Uh, sure. A lot of dynamics. So should I, as a, as a producer, allow you space? What I mean by that yeah. is, when I do a mix, yeah. you know, I might use a finalizer, I might use like a, you know, like a multiband compressor yeah. on the group, you know, on yeah. the group inserts. Yeah. Yeah. Should I th then not I'd do say, that? say, yeah, no, rather not. Yeah, like Murray and Dave were saying last night, mm. I saw, rather not. Better to let the mastering engine. L individual um, things like your kick drum and yeah, bass, I'd so, say, so yeah, go ahead. Per I mean, channel, yes, yeah, but yeah, for yeah. the actual master. But I'd yeah. say not over the okay. final mix. It's also not a good idea to master your own stuff. What I generally say to you guys is if you've got friends who are doing the same stuff as you um, and you both sort of want to master your own stuff, rather give him your track to master and you master That's his track. That's because you lose objectivity after working mm. on a track for so long. I've got an assistant that works with me that if I mix down a track that I've written, um, he will often do most of the mastering okay. with me mm. because um, he's got a more objective ear, yeah? mm. in terms of I've listened to it like five million times <laughs> and don't know where I am anymore. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just a bit of good advice, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. And is it an idea to do different passes of mixes as well, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there used to be a, uh, well there still is a school, especially in the States, where you do a different mix for every different format, TV, video, mm -hmm. um, CD, uh, uh, even adverts have a different sort of like way that they're mixed. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean there's, there's, and always lay down your, if, if you're doing a vocal track, always lay down your vocal mix. Um, and an instrumental, mm -hmm. so that you don't ever have to go back and go back to mix one. and do an acapella as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Cool. Yeah. As many different mixes as you want. I mean, that you can take them to the mastering engineer, and he'll choose the best one. But he'll charge you as well, right? Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> it's you can find a reasonable mastering guy that's not too expensive, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Or like you, like I was saying, if you've got a friend doing the same thing, give him your tracks, and he goes through yours, and mm -hmm. you go through his. It's much much better way of doing it. Let me um, ask you a question. Do you see a day where your job will become irrelevant? I don't think so. I think there'll always be a, a need for, um, for the human element in transferring to any format, mm -hmm. which is basically what I'm doing. I'm like, sort of like facilitating the transfer from one format mm -hmm. into another. Um, I think there'll always be a need for that. 